Today's sermon is entitled, Control Your Tongue. The passage that I've chosen is James chapter number 3, verses 1 to 2. Dictionary.com defines words as a unit of language, consisting of one or more spoken words of their written representation that functions as a primary carrier of their meaning. In other words, words are the primary means in which we use to communicate with one another. Our thoughts, our ideas, our concepts, the things that we want to share with each other are usually done through words, primarily. And I got thinking, words are incredibly powerful. They can be either used to build somebody up and treat them well and say really nice things to them, or words can be used to gossip and to criticize and to tear down other individuals. Words have meaning. And words are powerful. And that's what James is going to talk about in this passage. He's going to say, don't just let your words happen. Instead, make sure that you guard your words very carefully and make sure that every single one of them are for God and not for yourself. We have all had that moment. And I know I certainly have in my lifetime more than one of them where you blurted out a phrase and as soon as it comes off your tongue, you wish you hadn't said it. We've all had that experience, haven't we? It's not a very nice one. And sometimes when we say things, you can't take them back. You know what the reality is, is they don't just over time dissipate into nothingness. People remember them and they can be quite hurtful and they can cause all sorts of problems in relationships, not just for a few moments, but sometimes even for a lifetime. Words are powerful. So James says, here's what I want you to do when it comes to words. But before we get to that, let's talk about the power of words just a little bit more. First, Words can really inspire us, and words can be something that can actually be used to build people up in the faith, to love one another, and and to love God. Words can be very beneficial. I got thinking in Genesis chapter number one, it says, let there be light. You know, Genesis chapter number one is all about the creation of this world. And all of this world was created through the spoken word of God himself. Now that's power in words. But it's not just God who has very powerful words. Because we're created in His image, we also have power in our words. Not to the same extent for sure, but our words do matter. And they do have a profound effect upon others who hear them. I got thinking about uh, King David. You see that in the second picture there, this boy. And he's got this little sling and he's got a little tiny rock. and, And he has this situation that's in front of him. You know, he comes out and he meets his brothers. And his brothers are out, you know, out by this field. And he goes and brings them lunch. And he looks at them, and they're all perplexed. And he asks them, what's going on? And they look at him and say, well, we got this, uh, this big army over here, the Philistines. And they got this champion named Goliath. And Goliath is massive. And he keeps running down our religion, our beliefs, our God day in and day out. Of course, David gets quite disturbed about all of this. And he says, how dare Dare they mock my God? I love that phrase. You know what? I wish we had that phrase more often on the tip of our tongue when we hear other people in this world today mocking our God. I wish we had had that phrase ready to go. But how dare they? How dare they? David was highly insulted. So we know that later on, David actually goes and fights Goliath. And he says this, You come to me, Goliath, with a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. Now that's powerful words. And of course, we find out how powerful once that stone gets blessed by God and goes through the forehead of Goliath and he dies. We find out how powerful those words really are. But the reality is we like hearing about this story because we all have formidable enemies in our lives and we know we just want to have the right words to say to them to make a difference in their lives and to make sure that maybe possibly they'd stop picking on us. But you know what? Or they might come to know God even better yet. You know what? This is a beautiful story. And surely when we face the darkest of valleys, you know, those days where everything is going wrong, those moments in our life where nothing is going right at all and we're actually in great turmoil. Maybe our enemies are getting an upper hand on us or maybe our health is not very good or maybe having uh, relationship problems or financial problems. You know those times when things are bad. Well, you know what? It's really nice to turn to Psalms 23 that says, The Lord is my shepherd. He's going to take care of me. Not just anybody, but the Lord takes care of me himself. He refreshes my soul. He makes me walk by the the green pastures. He gets me to lie down and take a break. 
You know, when you're in the midst of a storm, nothing makes you more excited than the possibility of lying down and taking a break and getting some relief from whatever you're going through. And this is the words that we have from the psalmist. And it really inspires us from David when he says, he restores my soul. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. And what about Solomon? You know, he's tasked with making this beautiful temple for God. His dad, King David, had basically got all the supplies ready and they worked together and they understood how to make the temple, but it wasn't David's task to do so. It would be passed on to his son. After David passes away, Solomon starts working on that temple. And once he gets it completed, he gets up there and he gets ready to address the nation. Now, remember, he's the king. So he gets in front of everybody. And what's he going to say? This is a really big event, by the way. This took years, decades to actually finish. So what would he say to his people? Here's what he said. Ultimately, he said, the highest heavens cannot contain you, God. And yet, for some reason, you choose to come down here and spend time in this temple. Thank you, God. We humbly bow our knee to you, God. Beautiful words. Oh my goodness, we need to humbly bow our knee to God. The fact that he lives inside of our hearts, the fact that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit is truly an honor. And may we never forget it is. May we be like Solomon. May we be ready to get on our knees and say, thank you, Lord, for living inside of me. That is awesome and amazing, Lord, that you think that much of me. That's great. And I really need your help, Lord. And I got thinking, you know, ultimately, let's go a little bit further in the New Testament and talk about Peter. What about Peter and the apostles? You know, after Jesus ascends into heaven, they have this task to go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them basically to obey everything I commanded you. Surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. Of course, that's quite a challenge. Go and tell them about me. Of course, they went out and they told everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. They started telling the multitudes about him. And the Sanhedrin got very jealous and very upset and angry and bitter. And they arrest them. And they're thinking about it. They're thinking, what do we do with them? What can we do with the apostles? The crowds absolutely love them. They're doing miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't dare touch them. We don't dare kill them. That's for sure. The crowds will turn on us. What do we do? So they decided after much debate... We're going to tell the apostles, stop talking about Jesus. That was what they were supposed to do. They went to the apostles and say, you promise us you won't talk to Jesus ever again. That's all we ask from you. And of course, we know the response. And I love this response here. They said to the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the time, we must obey God rather than human beings. We're going to go out there and we're going to tell them all about Jesus, period. No matter what you say, no matter what you threaten, no matter what you do, we're going out there and telling them about Jesus. I really wish that we would have that attitude today. I really wish that Christians today would go out there and say, we will obey God rather than human beings. We're going to tell you all about Jesus, all about Jesus. You know what? This day and age, you know, everybody believes in everything, but I don't think they believe in anything at all. We got to get out there and tell them, you know what? There is absolute truth. And the absolute truth is Jesus Christ died and rose again for our sins. That's the absolute truth. Jesus Christ is the only way to get into heaven. That's the absolute truth. And we got to get out there like the apostles and say, I'm going to tell the world. I'm going to tell everybody. And what about the story? Does it not inspire us the words that Peter said to Simon the sorcerer? Remember, Simon came up one day and he said, my goodness, I see all of you apostles. You're all out there performing all these miracles. They say ultimately that that you've, you've done so many things. You know, you're healing the blind and you're, you're casting out demons and you're doing all these great and wonderful things. And you're drawing these huge crowds. And, you know, Simon the sorcerer looked at Peter and said, you know what? I like to have me some of that. And he said, would you sell me the Holy Spirit so that I can do the same miracles, I can draw the same crowds, and I can charge the money and I can make a fortune? Of course, Peter was not impressed, not even slightly. You can only imagine. And Peter goes and says to Simon, he says, you cannot buy the Holy Spirit. Definitely not. I think in a world of injustice, in a world where rich people get away with an awful lot nowadays, I think it's wonderful to hear that in God's kingdom, there is perfect justice. It's wonderful to hear that nobody can get into the kingdom of God except through 
faith. The way I get in the kingdom of God is the same way that you're going to get in the kingdom of God. There is no favoritism. For by grace ye are saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. These are beautiful words, and they truly do inspire us very much so. I got thinking about this last picture. Remember Paul? At the time, his name was Saul. And you know what? He says, ultimately, he says, nothing in the world will ever separate us from the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't start out that way. As Saul, he used to persecute the Christians, but now he's sitting back saying, nothing will ever separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also goes on and he says, wordless groans. The Spirit will speak and groan to God for the things we truly need that we can't even ask for. How many times have you gotten to a prayer? I know I have. You wonder, what should I pray for? Have you ever gone through a prayer and you wonder, that wasn't very good? That just didn't seem to hit the mark. I'm not sure if that honored God the way that it should. And isn't it wonderful to know that the spirit within us speaks to God and groans great and wonderful words that our prayers might not be feeble, but might actually be a sweet aroma unto God. I think that's beautiful. We can rejoice in all circumstances, it says in scriptures. And and because why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ has gone back to heaven to prepare a place for us. And one day he'll come again and he will be here. And that's my last picture. And that's the greatest promise of all. Those words I hang on to, especially when days are difficult. It's nice to hang on that Jesus coming back for us. Yes, Words, many words in the Bible can inspire us and get us closer to Jesus Christ and get us to love God and love each other. So there's lots of inspiring words. However, there are also contained within the Bible lots of words that are spoken harshly or rashly. Lots of words that are spoken that people wish they could have taken back and ultimately they could not. Lots of words that people regret. We know we've all gone through that experience. You say something... And then as soon as you say it, you regret it because you realize the harm and the damage that you've caused and the number of people that you've hurt. Let me give you some examples. I got thinking about Eve. Think about her just for a moment. You know, in her childbirth, when she's going through great pain and agony, which was part of the curse that was given in Genesis, would she not think back at the time when she was with the serpent? When the serpent asked her, you know what, you should really eat from this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, because the moment that you do, your eyes will be open and you will become like God. Wouldn't she reflect upon that as she's going through childbirth and realize I lied when I said God told me I couldn't touch a tree? That was my sin. That was my first sin. And look where I am now. Of course, she would be looking back at those words and saying, why did I say them? Why did I disobey God? I got thinking, ultimately, if we go to the next one, wouldn't the people, the people of God, the chosen people, they go through 10 plagues of Egypt. Egypt did. And actually, the people, Israel, were freed after 400 years of bondage, freed from tyranny. And now they were out on their own. And Moses goes up into this mountain and he's talking to God. And they're thinking he's never going to come back. So what do they do? They go to Aaron. And they say to Aaron, Aaron, make us into a golden calf that you see in the picture. And he says, you know what? Make us a beautiful golden calf, which represents the gods of Egypt, because we want to worship the gods of Egypt who got us out of Egypt. Can you imagine how angry God was when he found out the Israelite people forgot it was by his hand that they got out of Egypt, not by the Egyptian gods at all? He would have been extremely angry. It says he was in scriptures. And can you imagine how much they would have regretted when Moses was breaking those tablets? The fact that they had worshipped another God. They certainly would. And then the punishment that came afterwards was quite severe. You know what? The reality is that you got the uh, Levites, some of them going around and killing the people because God asked them to. They would have regretted it very much so. What if we go to the next picture? And we look at the Israelite people again, and you know, they, they, they're out in this, this desert, and they're heading towards the promised land, and the spies go, and the spies go and check out the land, 12 of them, one representing each tribe. And they come back, and 11 of the 12 spies say, we can't take the place. There's giants in this land, this promised land. There's no way we're ever going to take it. There was only one, Caleb, who actually said, you know what? Caleb and Joshua both, I guess, both said, we can take the land. But all the other 11 said, no, no, we can't take it. We can't do it. And you know, what a shame. Because those 11, I'm sure, and all of Israel regretted that decision. And those spoken words for the next 40 years, 
they would be in the desert with lots and lots of heat regretting what they had said. I got thinking, not just that. Let's go a little bit further. What about the story about the commander of the Syrian army? Now, he came and he started conquering all the lands around Israel. He comes into the area where King Hezekiah is, and he basically looks at his army and he says, give up. He tells them all, you've got to give up. You don't realize, but this is true. You've heard rumors. Yes, I have destroyed all the other kingdoms around you. And your neighbors all fell quite quickly and quite easily. And he said to them, you know what? Your God will not save you. You think your God's going to, but he's actually not going to. The other gods of the other places did not save them. And your God, I don't care who he is. I don't care where he is. He's not going to save you. Those were words the commander would soon regret. For at that night, the angel of the Lord, and I want to say one angel of the Lord shows up, and 185,000 of this army are slaughtered by that angel out of punishment. Can you imagine? One angel, not a league, not a legion of angels. One angel arrives and their army is decimated. Would they have regretted the words they said? Absolutely, of course they would have. They certainly would have. And what about Job? Job went through a lot. Job initially did not sin. Job goes through all these calamities because, you know, Satan's up there with God. And, and, you know, we know the story. We know, we realize that the story here is, is quite remarkable, where Satan says, you know what, here's the reality, God. Yeah, I know you say that Job's righteous, but if you take some things away from Job, then he's going to curse you and die. Well, he was allowed to. He took away his family, all but his wife, took away all of his wealth, none of that was left, and gave him sores and boils all over his body. His health was in jeopardy, had absolutely nothing but dust and ashes. Did he curse God? No. He refused to do so. But what he did do was a sin. He said, God, I want you to come down right now and justify me as to why you allowed this to happen to me. In other words, he says exact words, let the Almighty answer me. Those were words that Job would certainly regret, for God did come down. He came down in a whirlwind. And when God did come down, he said this, brace yourself like a man and get ready to answer me. And Job would have had fear and trembling and he regretted the words he spoke. Very much so. What about the next story? I got thinking about Judas. Judas who goes into the uh, the uh, chief priest and he says, you know what, I want to sell you Jesus, basically. He says, you know what, I'm going to tell you who Jesus is. I'm going to not only tell you who he is, because I know you know who he is, but I'm going to give you the opportune moment to arrest him where the crowds aren't around to defend him, which is what their real fear was, where he's all by himself and you can arrest him quite peacefully and take him away. So I'm going to give you that opportune moment. I'm going to show you the right time, in other words. And he sells Jesus for 30 shackles of silver. And then later on, he regrets these words. It says specifically in Scripture that he had great remorse over what he had said. And as a result of that, he brings back the silver. And he tries to give it back to the chief priest. Here you go. Have your silver back. I feel bad about what I did. It was wrong. Well, it was too late way too late. And they said, no, we can't take the silver back. And you have him throwing the silver back into the temple. And then he goes out and he hangs himself. Do we not think that Judas ultimately, while he was hanging himself, would have regretted the words that he said? You know, I want to buy Jesus. Absolutely not. I want to buy where Jesus is. I want to tell you where he is. I want to be a traitor, be known as a traitor forever. I'm sure he regretted those words. And what about Saul? We talked about him just a second ago. Saul certainly would have regretted his words for he gave out murderous threats, it says in scriptures, about Christians. In other words, I want them dead. Those people that follow the way, I want to imprison them. I want to have them killed. That's his attitude towards them. He was present at the stoning of Stephen and he actually gave his approval for it. Would he have regretted all of that? 100%. Absolutely. When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Sure, he would have regretted it. And then I got thinking about Satan himself. You know what? I'm not sure if Satan has any regret or will ever have any regret. I severely doubt it based on what we read in scripture. There's no indication Satan's ever going to regret what he's done. Absolutely not. But would Satan, when he's roasting in hell, for an eternity, will he look back upon his words and say, uh-oh, they were false? 
Absolutely. When he said, I will reach up the highest heavens and the stars of the sky and I will become much greater than God is, would he look at back at those words and say, eh, I was wrong? Absolutely. Of course he will. I doubt he'll ever regret it, but he certainly will um, basically look at those words and say, oh my goodness, I was wrong on so many levels. My point that I'm trying to make here is that words can build people up. Words can actually be very beneficial and can be a great blessing. But at the same time, words can tear down and can be awfully bad in our lives. We can't just let our mouths flap at the tongue. We've got to make sure that we control the words that come from our tongue. Words are so important um, that those people who want to make their career out of speaking words, especially inside of the church, should do so with fear and trembling. Since honor was given more often to the teachers of, of God's word, at back in Jesus' time especially, James was wrestling. He said, you know what, I got an awful lot of false teachers. I got a lot of people who don't even believe in Jesus Christ who are saying that they do and they're trying to teach God's word and they don't know his word because they don't know Jesus at all. And he said, I want to give a warning to them. I want them to know that when it comes time for all the other sinners who don't know Jesus Christ to burn in hell, they're going to burn even hotter. They're going to go through far more difficulties than anybody else. So powerful and important are words that James warns those who are going to teach the word of God. They should do so with great care for the judgment is going to be severe and more strict. False teachers, for example, we are told in the book of Jude, will get more hell in hell than any other one else. Wow, that's a warning. We should also heed James' warning, who said, if anyone causes these little, or Jesus' warning, who said, if anyone causes these little ones to sin, then it would be better for them, ultimately, to, to not be born. And he goes on, he says, it would be better for them to be, take a big old large millstone, hung around their neck, and put them in the depths of the sea. Warning from Jesus, be careful what we say. Be careful how we teach other people. Those who have the gift of teaching bear an awesome responsibility for the ex exercise of that gift in nurturing people of the faith is real. Not only will teachers of the words be judged more harshly for what they say, their lifestyles must match what they preach. There's the real difficulty to teach and to satisfy our own ego needs or in a manner that misrepresents and distorts the word of God will not go unnoticed by heaven, but will be recorded. And on the day that we go to heaven, we will be held accountable for every single word that we have ever said. Nothing will be lost. Scary, isn't it? Very much so. This is one of the reasons why I, as a pastor, ultimately, I spend about 15 hours working on a sermon. I read a lot of books. I read God's Word many times, and I go through and I read the commentaries, and I read the experts on the uh, Word of God more than once. And after I do all of that, I sit down and I pray and I ask God, I need the words. I need the right words. I want to make sure that I'm preaching what is right in your sight. Not what's right in other people's sight. Not what people want to hear. I don't want to preach what tickles their ears, as, as Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy says. People today just want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. I don't want to preach that. I want to preach what God would be happy with. What God would say, yes, that is my truth. So I spend a lot of time, 15 hours on every single sermon, just to make sure that I'm in the right place, that I've got the right words to speak. And then every day I try to pray like uh, Job did. Not that I'm like Job in any way, shape, or form, but I, I like to pray like Job did. Every day he was considered righteous in God's sight. Why? Because he prayed every day. He asked for forgiveness every day. So I try to do the same thing. And I want to say this. Even though James in this part of his passage is mostly talking about false teachers, he, and, 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 maybe, and he's also talking about pastors too, um, it's for everyone. You know what? We'll all be held accountable. There are people and, and that have the ability to teach, yes. But there's also other people at times that will be asked for the reasons why we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to get those reasons. In those moments of teaching, we want to make sure what we say is true and it is real. We will be held accountable too, even if we are not a pastor, even if we are not you know, a teacher or trying to fill that role, we will be held accountable in front of God for every word we speak. So you got to be careful of that. James is trying to say it's for everyone. Don't think this passage is just for pastors. Now, James says, is it possible ultimately to hold the tongue? 
He's going to ask this question. It's a tough question to ask. James ultimately says that we all stumble and fall short of God's glory. That's the first thing he says. Yes, nobody's perfect. And yes, everybody has a problem. Everybody ultimately has an issue. But is it possible, though, for the tongue to control the rest of our lives? And for James, the answer is yes. Yes, a small part of our body, the tongue, can actually control the way we walk, the way we talk, our relationship with God to a certain extent. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, I want to give James explanation. I want to give his examples that he gives of something small controlling something really large. Okay, I was at uh, uh, my last church. There was a deacon there and his family owned a whole bunch of horses. One of the horses that they owned was a Clydesdale. I had to do some research. I looked it up and I found out that a Clydesdale is between 1,800 and 2,000 pounds. They can be that heavy. I got thinking, oh my, you certainly don't want to be stepped on by one of these so beautiful animals. Definitely not. They are massive. It also says, uh, according to the numbers, that they can pull up to 8,000 pounds. Okay, I weigh about about 200 pounds, pretty, pretty much around there, 206, 207. And I got thinking, you wait a minute now, hold on a second now, 200 pound person. How could you ever think of controlling an 1,800 to 2,000 pound animal? And the answer is through a bit. Of course, there's other things associated with this. And I'm no horse trainer. I know there's other things in the training process. But in the end, after all the training is done, how do you control the horse? Through the bridle and the bed. Can you imagine that? That's, that's just staggering. What about a ship? The, the, the Titanic. I got thinking about it. The Titanic was approximately 52,000 tons. I can't even begin to think of how heavy that is. I can't even begin to think how big and massive that Titanic ship was. And I got thinking, how big was the rudder? The rudder was approximately 0.2% in comparison of weight of the whole ship. 0.2%. Not even 1% of the weight or the size of the ship was in the rudder. And yet the rudder could fully steer that ship. Can something small actually control or move or set into the right direction something large? The answer, according to James, is yes. James is not saying that one can use the tongue to command the whole body to become spiritually mature. I wish that was the case. I wish I could command my legs and my arms and my mind and my nose and every single part of me to be like God. That would be awesome. That would be great. But James is not saying that. He's not saying that at all. He's saying this, as the bit determines the direction of the horse and the rudder of the ship, so can the tongue determine the destiny of the believer. If one cannot constrain or restrain the tongue, then it is probable that the rest of one's life will be out of control too as well. If we can learn to control the tongue, then ultimately everything else in our lives will consider to be very easy in comparison. In other words, the tongue is that difficult to control. Or as we will see later in the passage, ultimately then, the tongue is like a spiritual barometer. If my tongue is flapping all the time and is actually tearing people down, then I'm not very close to God at all. We're going to find this to be true. And if I am saying all good things about people and loving them and loving God, then my, then my spiritual life is actually getting much closer to God. We're going to see how this plays out in a moment. But let's go on with James. He's got a little bit more that he wants to say as an example. James warns us that the believer, that the tongue can boast that it's very powerful, but that power can either be for good or for bad. And he talks about the bad. He says, often the tongue is a source of much sin in our lives. To illustrate this point, how the tongue can actually set afire a whole bunch of problems in our lives, he says this, he says, think about how a spark can start a forest fire. On October the 8th, 1871, Miss Olry's cow kicked over a lantern at 8.30 p.m. that led to the Great Chicago Fire, where 100,000 people were homeless, 17,500 buildings destroyed, 300 people died, and $40 million worth of damage because a cow kicked over a lantern. And I'm not blaming the cow, by the way. Uh, but you, you can you imagine this. One small little accident and this fire blazed and look at all the damage it caused. It's massive. 
How many churches ultimately have been ruined by gossip and slander? How many individuals have had their reputation ruined because people talked about them, especially Christians? People who would never think about setting fire on their neighbor's house don't think twice about gossiping about someone and ruining their reputation and doing spiritual, basically spiritual arson on their soul. Many of us have started gossip fires without a second thought of the potential damage, how disappointing God is with this sin, or the fact that those who gossip with us gossip against us. Think about that for a moment. It's really true. Those who gossip with us are the ones who gossip against us. Because as soon as you leave the person who's gossiping with you, they're going to be talking about you. That's always the case. You know what? And it's what a shame. Okay, I got thinking about this. I believe that the believers had in mind, ultimately, that we were supposed to be more like Jesus here. We're supposed to try to stay away from using that tongue to destroy. Instead, we should use that tongue to glorify God in everything that we do. Like Apostle Paul. Do we have to cry out to Abba the Father all the time to save us? Yes. We always cry out, wretched, wretched as I am. God, please save me. Why is it the things I always want to do I never do, Paul says? And why are those things that I shouldn't do are the things that I always do? He says, help me, God. Help me so very much. If we are to boast, we are to boast in the fact that God can and does help us say the right things. Okay, let's go on to the next part here. James goes on and he says this, For every kind of beast and of the birds and of the serpents and all the things of the sea, humanity has been able to tame them and they have been tamed by us. But the tongue, no one can tame. It is unruly, evil, and filled with poison. Oh my goodness, that's powerful. What James is saying that our odds of learning how to train an 8,000 pound elephant, even though I don't know nothing about taming any animals, or a ferocious tiger is substantially better than taming the tongue because we got 0% chance of doing so based on our own effort. The inability of the human race to tame the tongue is evidence of the irrational nature of its orientation and effort. If the tongue is beyond taming, then why does Apostle Paul say that we're supposed to let no unwholesome talk proceed from our mouths, lest we grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 29-30? If it is not possible to stop gossiping, slandering, blaspheming, profaning, uh, complaining, and criticizing, then why even try to control one's speech when in an unguarded moment and that critical defamatory comment comes out of our mouths, then everything's ruined anyway. And yes, we have poison on our lips. So why bother even trying if we can't accomplish the goal? In response to these questions, Augustine says this, James is not saying the tongue cannot be controlled. He's saying no human can control the tongue. There's a big difference. We need God's help. That's what it really boils down to. If we're going to say the right things, we're only going to do so through the grace of God Almighty and through his power, but not through our mights. Who will save us from our sinful natures? Christ who purchased our lives with his. Like our salvation, taming the tongue is impossible by our own effort, but by the grace and the strength of God controlling the tongue, it's not only possible, but expected. Remember what Peter said, Be holy as God is holy. Due to our fallen nature still existing, we, of course, cannot perfectly tame the tongue, but we certainly must try to do so, for through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is possible to take our thoughts captive for the Lord Jesus Christ and make them honorable unto him. Are we going to slip? Yes. James said that at the very first. He says, yes, we do slip. But can we keep our tongue majority of the time focused on loving God and loving each other? The answer is yes, but only through God's help. And we desperately need his help in order to do so. James goes on and he says this, above all, James says, above all, in all of his teaching that he's given us so far, he says, make sure you use the tongue the right way when you talk about people. Out of the same tongue come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. This shouldn't be this way at all. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. The problem is that ultimately both cursing and blessing are directed at the same object, God and the person made in the image of God. Cursing is especially heinous for in the Old Testament times. It was usually a desire that the other person would be separate from God forever and burn in hell forevermore. Obviously, we don't want that for anybody. 
I remember as an example meeting a leader and there was this fellow that I met and uh, I really thought a lot of him to be very honest. He read the Bible, which lots of Christians do, but the way that he read his Bible and the sincerity and the way he dug into passages was just beautiful. He prayed and he prayed such wonderful prayers. It was just incredible. And uh, he was the kind of guy that would help anybody. Didn't matter who you were. Didn't matter what station you had in life. And you could even call him up at three o'clock in the morning. And on his lips would be, brother, sister, how can I help you? And he meant it. He would literally get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. He'd go see you and he would help you at that very moment. That's the kind of guy this guy ultimately was. I thought the world of him. I thought he was a spiritual giant, to be very honest. And I thought I probably can learn an awful lot from this fella. Then one day I looked at his Facebook. And the first part of his Facebook, I saw wonderful messages about God. Saying we should love God and we should love one another. And there was lots of them. And I thought, wow, this guy's exactly who I thought he was. You know how some people put a mask on in church. They look one way and they act another way when they leave the church. I thought, well, maybe possibly that's what this guy's like. But no, at the first part of his Facebook, I saw nothing but love for God and love for each other. But then I went a bit further into his Facebook and I found something else. The other half of his messages were all about tearing down people. He had a lot of people that he did not like. And when he didn't like somebody, he tore them good. And he put all sorts of hateful messages in there about how much he hated his enemies and how much he wanted to see them get what was coming to them. And I got thinking, my goodness, that is not right. That is just not right. And I was so disappointed with him. Like John in the story, our witness to the world is negated by the slander that we say towards other people because ultimately Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus doesn't say, you know what, if a person treats you really bad, then you're justified in beating them down or saying bad things about them. Jesus says, no matter what they say about you, no matter what they do to you, love your enemies, do good to them, show them love and respect, do good to them and bless them. Pray for them always. Wow. Every time that we tear down, criticize, gossip, slander, somebody made in the image of God, are we not dishonoring the one who, while we were his enemies, showed us love by atoning on the cross and dying for us? And the answer is yes, we very much so do. What James is saying is that acting against people who resemble God is the same as acting against God who created the people in the first place. If we are genuine to, to love as Christ did, and he died once and for all, then our love must not also be for those who love us, but for everyone that we meet, including and especially our enemies. For James to speak in love towards all others goes a long ways, James says, towards controlling the tongue. Definitely. I want to finish with this. James says ultimately that we got to tame the tongue, but we can also look at the tongue and find out what our spiritual life is really like. James asks, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? And the answer is absolutely no. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? And the answer is no. Well, neither can a spring, a salt spring, produce fresh water. Verses 11 to 12. In other words, what James is saying, that the words that we express on our lips, we will know the spiritual temperature of our hearts. If we gossip and slander against other people, it's not just because they've done something against us, but ultimately it is because we have wickedness within our hearts and somebody else gave us the opportunity to express that wickedness to them. So if we find our tongues always flapping and tearing down those people who made the image of God, what should we do? What should we do to control the tongue then? I found three things, not just from James, but from other parts of the Bible. Three things, solid things that we can do. Number one, first, we got to ask God to examine our hearts. Examine my heart, the psalmist says. And he says, if you find any sin in there whatsoever, point it out to me. Give me the strength and the power to confess those sins and make it right with you, Lord. The second thing is confession. First John 1, 9, if, if you uh, confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive all sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And step number three is ask. God, help me, help me, help me. Oh, wretched man I am, or oh, wretched woman I am. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me control that tongue. I will never do it, God, on my own. I will never say all the time the right things. I know that. But I want to say them 95 or 100, or close as I can get to 100% of the time. But I'll never even come close to that without you, Lord. In other words, God put a bit in my mouth. Steer me. Show me. Control me. 
Show me how to live a life for you. Show me how to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And show me how to love the people around me. Show me. Show me how to take every single word captive and make it obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me the power to do so. Never stop, never stop coming into my heart, God, molding me and reshaping me and renewing my mind and transforming my heart so that I'm always more like you. I want to be like you, Lord, in all that I do. Let us pray. I am yours, Lord. I gladly bow my knees and pray that you would teach me to love not only those who love me, but my enemies as well. Search me, O Lord, and if you find any offensive thoughts within me, then by your grace and your power, may I ask and receive your forgiveness and your cleansing. Lord, please never stop taming my tongue and transforming my heart into your likeness. I love you, Lord, and I will always need you, my portion, my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Amen. I hope and pray that you take this to heart. I know I certainly have. And I hope and pray that you will have a blessed day Sunday. And I hope that you uh, ask God, help me control my tongue. Help me control my tongue, Lord, so that I might please you. Amen.